A sweatshop is modern day or postmodern day slavery. People working in dreadful conditions, being paid you know, a pittance, if anything. People are expected to work incredibly long hours. Got people doing 18 hour days for no money. Dangerous working conditions. There's no human rights. They use a lot of child liver. Women, children, people that are easily exploitable. Sexual violence, sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, and all of that kind of thing happens within the sweatshop industry as well. The argument is basically that there's nothing else for people to do. Um, they're the best jobs that people in developing countries can get, so we shouldn't regulate them. That is the basic tenet of neoclassical free market economics. Just leave private capital to do what it does and everything will be peachy. Now, I think that's clearly bollocks. Don't be one of these people who's just like, yeah, but you know, they're earning without the, without the sweatshops, they'd be begging in the streets. It doesn't matter, you know, the fact is you're exploiting these people, so don't exploit people. Whatever corporate uh, fluff some of these places, uh, some of these companies trot out there to uh, make it seem like they're responsible corporate citizens or whatever. I think the reality on the ground is it's a climate of fear and exploitation that these people work under. You can't judge it in degrees. It makes no difference. It's, by, it, it's the same system destroying people's lives. This isn't really what we want. We want to have something that's consistent with the values that we're talking about. The only reason why working class people essentially have ever gotten a share of the pie is through fighting for it. Places that are not only sweatshop free but are union as well so you know the labour is getting treated well. We're, we're down for the unions aren't we? I think unions are a really important source of power in terms of challenging the bosses. I think strikes are a massively important way of moving forward. A decent minimum wage, regulation of hours and really importantly um, a recognition that workers have the right to organise. Obviously workers' co-ops are a massive, massive step up from sweatshops because you can ensure that people are working for a living wage. It doesn't take a sort of brain surgeon to sort of think that we all ought to have dignity. You know, it's simple really. You know, I'm mixed race, my dad was a first gen immigrant and the punk scene is like one of the few places where I see people really caring about this kind of global international solidarity. Bands, you know, pride themselves on being DIY, so doing everything themselves, but they've overlooked where they buy and source their t-shirts from. You might have a punk band that's selling some t-shirt with some slogan about workers' rights, fuck the bosses, smash capitalism or something, and it's on a, a commercially produced t-shirt. It's a complete contradiction. I think a key one for us is like that the majority of sweatshop workers are women. So you can't really be in a feminist band and then like support the exploitation of women um, through the use of sweatshops. It's just hypocrisy, isn't it? You know, if on one hand I'm saying freedom and, and peace for people and there's, you know, some kid, you know, working their little fingers, little jobs, you know, sort of to make my trainers or whatever. Absolutely, we are all hypocrites. Like, I don't think anyone's like totally perfect um, but I think, I think there are like quite simple things that we can do to like avoid pretty major hypocrisies. And we're as guilty as, lo as lots of other bands. Don't let's just blame ourselves you know it's not all my fault and it's not all the band's fault and, and people you know we're, we're trying the best we can. I mean we're all upholding capitalism anyway like the punk scene works as like its own little mini capitalist system but then further supporting exploitation within that system is pretty bleak. I opposed putting Holiday in Cambodia in a Levi's commercial and my main reason for opposing that so vehemently is because of the sweatshop issue. It's an ongoing struggle because it all to me comes back to can I live with myself if I know somebody making stuff that I'm getting money from or has my name on it, the people who make it are being treated absolutely horribly. I guess in, in the punk scene, you can do your bit. Practice what you preach. You can make a difference. It ain't gonna take that much just to spend you know, a little bit more, get an ethically sound t-shirt and, and be, be proud about it. You can't look at everything in terms of financial expense. What's the expense in terms of sweatshop workers 
dying in a factory. If you've got to pay an extra two quid for a t-shirt, you pay that. I'd rather pay less than the price of a half pint in London and know that my t-shirt is actually going to help some people. We have no alternative if we're free thinking, good thinking, clean thinking people to act. This punk ethics campaign is part of a bigger movement. In particular, Punk Ethics is working with No Sweat, which is an organisation that campaigns against sweatshops in general and is selling t-shirts from a cooperative owned and run by former sweatshop workers. This project is, we love it because we want to make core business, no one is slave in this world. And the time has come to start to think about this and to, to start to try and change this. If more and more bands start to say, we're not going to put up with this, we're going to source our t-shirts ethically. That's why it's important to get involved, not as a self-righteous thing or not as like an ethical consumer badge, but as trying to build and support a political movement. So really the questions are all down to us, you know, they're not down to what's wrong with the world, the questions are really what's wrong with me, you know, and, and if you like, why aren't I doing anything about it? This is what you're singing about, this is what all these bands are singing about, all the people that come to the gigs, they're singing along, shouting for this stuff, <laughs> time to put our money where our mouths are. Those words, those immortal words, do they owe us a living? Well, you know, do we owe sweatshop workers a living? Yeah, of course we fucking do. Punk ethics, don't be a dick. Uh, we're now joined by uh, Jay from the Punk Ethics Campaign. Um, Jay, we've just watched uh, one of your campaign videos. Um, I will start, I guess, talking about this idea of, of punk ethics. Um, is there a particular set of ethics that uh, the punk ethics campaign holds to, or is it something less defined than that? Um, definitely less defined. We haven't sort of laid out any specific program or ethics to for the punk scene to adhere to or anything like that. Um, to be honest, it was just cool name in some ways, but the the name came from the desire to to do some sort of like political organising in the punk scene. Like a lot of the stuff I've been involved with in the past is sort of benefit gigs and punk is like, you know, does benefit gigs better than anyone generally. It's like a big thing. But trying to get punks to move beyond that into more concerted political direct action or anything like that is often more challenging. So the idea was to try and create a small group that can, rather than focusing on music, can focus on political action in some way and drive that through. And, you know, anarchism sort of is the ideology most associated with punk, but there, it, through that, you've ended up with a kind of subgenre of like anarcho-punk. So rather than just become a, an anarcho-punk-based outfit in some way and get labelled in that way, we wanted to kind of reach out to the, the broader scene, if you like, you know, the wider aspects of punk and try and motivate people into political action and make people think in different ways. Um, so the result of that is rather than defining ethics, we basically went with kind of basic anarchist principles of, you know, you know, if you go back to the early days of punk, it was a rejection of the status quo, a rejection of hierarchy overall, you know, no heroes and all that sort of stuff. Um, and generally punk sort of sided with the, with the underdog, you know, against oppression sort of thing. So just going on those base levels, you can take on various aspects of politics and try and do concerted action. So one of the early actions we did when we first started out was um, sort of against a corporation called, well, a company called Brewdog, who you probably know, did a punk IPA beer. We, Brewdog sort of done this uh, cease and desist letter to a small independent bar that was wanted to set itself up and call itself Draft Punk. That was it, right? Play on that Daft Punk band. Um, which was fair enough, you know, no one would have objected, but they sent them a cease and desist letter saying we own the word punk. So that turned up in the papers and stuff. I read that and we had a chat with a collective and sort of said, well, let's do something about this. And we wrote a mock cease and desist letter from punk 
to Brewdog, made it like an open letter, sent it out to the media, and it sort of said things like, you know, we've been watching you for a while, we've been enjoying your lager, but now you're taking a piss. You don't own the word punk, we do. <laughs> and then got it signed by about 200 punk bands from literally from across the world, from California to Japan, and put it out there. So it was that kind of like, it was a bit of a cheeky action, but getting that that kind of activity going was the the idea behind punk ethics to do that kind of stuff. And then we went on from there to do a big beat, uh, gig on the beach of the River, River Thames with the comedian Mark Thomas, which was a, a sort of reclaiming a public space and that kind of thing. So getting punks to, whilst you're, punks are really good at writing songs about stuff and doing benefits to raise money for stuff, trying to get them to think outside the box and do more concerted political action in some ways. Okay, so uh, we've just watched the uh, video about the Punks Against Sweatshops campaign, which you've mentioned a few times uh, already uh, in our discussion. I was struck in that video by the repeated mention of things like uh, workers' cooperatives, a clear recognition of class analysis and class struggle, and union activism in in that campaign video. Um, but from some of the things you read about DIY punk, um, it's often criticised, including by some anarchists, as being um, entrepreneurial or individualist. So I wonder how that conception of DIY punk sits with the uh, collectivist and production side ideas that, that we saw in the video. Yeah, so I think there's often a misconception of the DIY aspect of punk in the sense that like it goes back to the original days of you can do it yourself. You don't have to be in a music school for years to learn to play guitar or whatever. You just go out and do it. It's, it's literally do it yourself. And in the wider punk movement, it, it, that goes on to things like making your own fanzines. So that kind of aspect of DIY was a foundation of punk, but it's rarely ever a, an individualistic thing. It's much more a community thing. Like one of the actions we did with the Burmese punks after all the solidarity work was actually we'd done a crowdfunder and brought them over for a tour in the UK. Like Lee Singh is a very charismatic guy and he, he had this wonderful way of saying, okay, DIY is the, the punk thing, but I've got, we've got a new thing now. It's DIT, do it together. And it was all about that coming together because they understood everything that they do in, in Myanmar needs to be done as a collective unit because of the forces that are against them sort of thing. So in punk generally, I think DIY is, has that collective aspect in it, inherent in it, whether you want to call it DIY or DIT or whatever. Um, that transfers into the, the garment industry aspect of it, like organising a punk skin sweatshops campaign was generally about trying to get the understanding out there. So we put out a, a leaflet that is a bit of an attack. We play, played on Steve Ignorant's um, Do They Owe Us A Living song and basically wrote, a, wrote a, a leaflet that said, do they owe us a living? No, we owe sweatshop workers a living and then do a big rant. And in that rant, we say something like, you know, you punks don't make t-shirts, garment workers do. And that's very much a, a case of like, you got to think about beyond the, the base you know your small confines of of your small scene your the the t-shirts you're selling or the t-shirts you're wearing come from somewhere and those people are often being exploited in a way that doesn't chime with the politics that you hold so what do we do about that and rather than simply taking an individualistic approach it's about looking to that's it you know bringing in the solidarity aspect and saying okay well who are making these who's making these clothes and what are they doing in terms of to fight against the system and how can we support them? And so it becomes that collective. So I think, yeah, to go back to the original thing, the DIY individualist thing is a bit of a misconception from my, my view. I, I do agree with you, but uh, I had to play devil's advocate, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think in the video, uh, was it Ren from Petrol Girls um, made a little comment, described punk as a, as a mini capitalist system, which I thought was... Uh, was interesting. I, I totally know what she's saying. I mean, it, obviously, it's you have to buy things and produce things, um, and even within the the punk um, circuit, things are are cheap or they have pay no more than notices. But it's it's not free from that capitalist exchange framework. Um, so I wonder, you know, is is DIY uh, necessarily anti capitalist, or can it be, or should it be, or is DIY just a kind of nice capitalism? Good question. Um, I think it can be. 
But I think, I mean, everything, even the anarchist community generally is like not exempt from the capitalism. We have anarchist bookshops all over the world and stuff like that. So it's a similar thing that anarchism literally promotes anti-capitalism, but it, it sells books and makes an income. But it tries to create a sort of circular economy often in these situations by publishing your own books and stuff like that. And the same goes with the punk world, that we try and keep the you know, the money inside the punk scene in some ways. It doesn't work that way very often because <laughs> you end up, you know, hiring venues and paying corporations that rent out music equipment and stuff like that. But but to some extent, it's about supporting the bands that that, that you love and that, that you want to go and see. They need to get by, so they often need to, um, you know, get some diesel for the band to get them to the next show. And Ren makes the point, I'm not sure if it, was in, if it ended up in the cutting room floor of the film, but she said something along the lines of, um, you know, merch is massively important in getting the money to buy that diesel and stuff like that. But it doesn't chime well if the merch you're selling is made in a sweatshop. And the point she was making about the mini capitalist system chimes with or ties in with the wider point we were trying to do when we were making the film. We didn't want to be creating something that was just pointing fingers. We wanted to, to like get the message across that sweatshops are everywhere. You're no one is perfect we're all hypocrites when it comes to this. Like me, you, every band that's singing about social justice in some way, fuck the bosses. I think Deke says, you know, fuck the bosses, smash system. It's printed on your t-shirt, but it's made in a sweatshop. It's a, a hypocrisy, but it's a hypocrisy we're all guilty of. And so then Ren makes the point like, you know, we're, we're all upholding the system anyway. It's just part and parcel of it, but there you can work against it. So I feel like DIY can be anti-capitalist in a capitalist system. But, you know, it's, it's the age old problem of how do you survive in a capitalist system without money and without, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, punk has been criticised by some people within the anarchist movement. Um, I think Norman of Rocky calls him the culturally challenged anarchoids, which I quite like. He's an anarchist violinist. Um, but some of these anarchists who are culturally challenged criticise punk for being uh, lifestylist. That's the term they use, borrowed from uh, Murray Bookchin. Um, and they look especially at punk's focus on consumption or even consumerism um, as, as part of that criticism. Uh, in the video, I think it was Sarah from Miserable Wretch touched on that and she talked about this idea of uh, an ethical consumer badge. Um, I wondered in what way the punk against sweatshop campaign goes beyond that ethical consumer badge criticism. Um, I'd, I'd... First off, I say I definitely think it does, although the irony is we literally created an ethical consumer badge making this campaign. <laughs> On the website, you can download a little badge that says Punks Against Sweatshops. The idea was, you know, use this to when you're selling your merch. This is a way of identifying the fact that your T-shirts are sourced ethically. But we wanted to go beyond that because the like, my other activism was with a group called No Sweat, and this is where the sort of punk ethics and anti-sweatshop came overlapped is me bringing the two together in some ways um and the big part of no sweat has always been against boycotts and about solidarity with workers in the garment industry you know literally helping people when they go on strike supporting them and stuff like that so in the video and in the campaign generally we wanted to get that message across that you know we should be as punks that are singing about you know social justice issues and all that kind of thing we should be thinking about who's making our clothes but you don't end there. It's a, it's a wider political movement than that. It's a wider social movement than that, that you've got to think about the the people that are making their clothes and how you can support them. Like, you know, who gives a shit if you shop, shop at Tesco's to get your underwear, as long as you're fighting for the rights of the workers that are in that situation. You know, there's bigger issues around, you know, um, environmental destruction in the garment industry that needs to be taken into consideration. But on that very basic level, it was, let's, initially in the punk scene we can do something to stop the infiltration and support alternatives to the to the capitalist sweatshop system and no sweat has an, an option where they're working with a worker-owned uh, factory in bangladesh if you direct you know source your t-shirts from there that helps that project builds a, a workers in initiative and and promotes that um so let's move beyond the sort of ethical consumer badge approach and start thinking about how we can work in solidarity with garment workers more widely. To go back to the lifestyle thing, I think that's an interesting one. Because like, I mean, I've been, I 
I've been calling myself an anarchist for about 20 years and I read Murray Bookchin's essay, The Unbridgeable Chasm. And at a time I was sort of sympathetic to it. I thought, yeah, I completely understood, but I'm giving it a bit more thought. I kind of thought, who gives a shit? You know, <laughs> it seemed a bit like personalities rather than actual politics that were really debating there because like in the punk, if you translate it to the punk scene, yeah. A big criticism of lifestylists, I think, was the temporary autonomous zone thing. If you've got a temporary autonomous zone in the punk scene, you could look at a squatter punk that cracks a squat, sets up a social centre that is mainly populated by punks, but is open to everyone. And they organise gigs and do a couple of benefit gigs and stuff like that. Part of that lifestyle is often things like dumpster diving or skip diving or whatever you want to call it, you know. And like you say, focusing on that anti-consumerism aspect, but not focusing on political action, concerted institutional you know like unions and stuff like that i think was the criticism um and while that's a, it's valid to identify that the world seems to be a lot bigger than that than it, you know what i mean it's like if you think in this day and age especially the the squatter punk that lives in the squat and dumpster dives which i have to admit i've never been one of those guys it's just not my thing but i've certainly turned up to the squats and enjoyed the gigs that they put on you know but that those punks that are doing that will often find that they need to earn some money to, you know, everyone needs a bit of money. So they'll go and get a job and it's usually in the gig economy. Yeah. So a popular one is bicycle couriers for punks. There's plenty of punks for bicycle couriers. They soon come to face like the exploitation in that industry. And the reaction is often to join up with the IWW or the IWGB and get involved in some political action that way. Some, you know, some solidarity action to go on strike or whatever. So they're literally doing both the lifestyleist and the social. So they're not mutually exclusive. And I always feel like anyone who criticizes the lifestyleism of it is just, it goes back to that finger pointing thing of like, you know, the world is bigger than this. I think, it, you know, I've always been a fan of the anarchists against adjective, adjectives idea, just because we've got a big enough enemy with the system as it is, capitalism and the state and all that, and you're going to just squabble over the, the, the best end result you can get without actually working out how you're going to get there. And I think it was Malatesta who sort of like said that great stuff around, um, you know, you can experiment with like collectivism, communism, individualism in different parts as the revolution progresses to see which one works and the ones that work will go forward and the ones that don't will drop off. And that applies to the lifestyleism thing. You know, if, if, if squatters are going to be able to change the world through cracking squats, go for it. I don't think they are, but I want them to carry on doing what they're doing because they're creating great spaces for people to do some interesting stuff and do some creative stuff. In the meantime, they also need to get involved in things like punk skin sweatshops where they're working to build solidarity with garment workers on the other side of the world or in Leicester for this case. You know what I mean? So it's that kind of thing that I feel like we need to move beyond that unbridgeable chasm. We need to build a bridge over that unbridgeable chasm and just get over it, you know? Too right. Really interesting. And uh, thanks for giving us the connection with uh, Asel as well. That was another uh, great session. Okay. Well, that, that Hopefully that will be our, our next international solidarity campaign. We're hoping to help support him all the more Brilliant. In, in the months to come. Thanks very much.